Good morning. Welcome to Campbelltown Free Church for morning worship. We're delighted that you're able to join with us to worship God, to praise him, to listen to his word and to give him the love and devotion of our hearts. So let us worship God. Let us pray. O Lord, the maker of heaven and earth and the redeemer of your people, it is our greatest privilege, supreme delight and primary purpose for our existence to gather to worship you. It is so good to praise you, Most High, and to proclaim your love and faithfulness. And yet you have explained in your word that the more spiritual activity we take part in, the more active indwelling sin will be producing weariness, distracting thoughts, divided affections and lack of understanding, which devalues the worship we give to you. So help us then by your spirit to put to death the misdeeds of the flesh so that we might worship you in the way you deserve and in the way you desire. Energize us by your spirit so that all our minds, affections and wills might travel in one direction to glorify and enjoy you. Be with us, bless us with a sense of your presence and give us sensitivity to your voice in your word. And we ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. We're going to sing together part of a psalm that expresses our delight and desire to meet with God as we worship him on this last Sunday of the old year. It's Psalm 63 verses 1 to 8. O God, you are my God alone. I seek your face with eagerness. My soul and body thirst for you in this dry, weary wilderness. We're going to sing it to the tune Wareham and we thank Glasgow City Free Church for the use of their music. O God, you are my God. Saviour in Jesus. 
You sent him to fulfill everything you had spoken in the past through your prophets and everything that you had promised in the past in the covenant you swore with Abraham and David. We praise you that in Jesus coming to die, you crushed Satan's head. And as a result, you saved us from our great enemies of sin, death and hell. We praise you that in Jesus coming to die, you blessed your people on earth with freedom from sin's control, forgiveness of sins and friendship with you. We praise you that in Jesus coming to die, you have established him as your king to reign over your people forever and to bring us under your gracious rule. Lord God, nothing we are or will become and nothing we have done or will do forced you to do what you have done for us. You have shown mercy to us because you delight in showing mercy. It is because of your tender mercy that you have come to us in Jesus, the rising sun from heaven, and turned your face towards us to bless us. Lord God, you have rescued us so that we might serve you, but we confess that so often we serve ourselves and our own interests. You have delivered us so that we might live in holiness and righteousness before you all our days. But we acknowledge that impurity so quickly and so easily pollutes our thinking and lack of integrity so frequently characterises our dealing with others. You have saved us so that we might walk in the light of your truth, but we admit that we often prefer darkness, refusing to be shaped by your values and standards and instead allowing our own distorted ideas and the jaundiced opinions of other people to dictate to us the way we act and think. You have redeemed us in order to guide our paths, our feet in the path of peace. But we cannot deny the fact that we slip back into old habits of living in malice and in envy towards others. Lord God, we are not only disappointed at ourselves for our failures and not only embarrassed by the hurt that we have caused to others, but most of all, we are ashamed of the way our behaviour has brought your great name and the good name of the gospel into disrepute. Yet in the midst of all our disappointment, embarrassment and shame, your trustworthy word comes ringing in our ears that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So as we come to you seeking your forgiveness, we are filled with the assurance that you sent Jesus, your son, in the likeness of sinful flesh in order to condemn sin, dealing effectively with it and its consequences. We plead Jesus' obedience and righteousness as our only hope and asking that for his sake, you would have mercy on us once more and forgive us again and pardon us from our sin and failure. Lord God, as we gather to worship you, be with us. May we be in the spirit this Lord's day, experiencing his power so that we might sense your presence, hear your voice and give glory to you. Hear us and do us good. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen. We're going to read from God's word from Matthew chapter 2. We're going to read about the visit of uh, the wise men to, to Jesus, um, a story that's often read uh, at Christmas time, but it probably took place about two years after Jesus was born. Matthew chapter 2, we're going to read uh, verses uh, 1 to 12 and 16 to 18. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the reign of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the clans and rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. 
Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent to them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I, may, I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When Herod realised that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were under two years old, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Amen. We're going to praise God again. This time we're going to use the words uh, of a hymn that expresses our hope in God alone. In Christ alone my hope is found. And we thank St Peter's Free Church in Dundee for the use of their music.
to read again from God's Word, this time from the last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. We're going to read chapter 12 together. But before we uh, do so and look at what it's saying to us, let's pray and ask for God's help. Gracious God, how good you are in alerting us to the twisted tendencies of our sinful hearts. We are so skilled in reconstructing you into a God who is shaped by our own thinking and who is indifferent towards the way that we live. Our idolatrous misrepresentation of you results in our failure to honour and worship you as we should. So as we turn to your word, that even more reliable revelation of your character and requirements than we find in your creation, erase from our thinking the lies which we are so prone to accept as fact and instead fill our minds with your truth. Dispel the darkness from our minds and instead flood us with a clear vision of your true glory. O Lord, for the sake of Jesus, may your Holy Spirit open our eyes that we may see wonderful things in your law. Amen. Revelation chapter 12. A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its head. He, his tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up by God to his throne. The woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth, and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now has come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers, who accuses them before our God day and night, has been hurled down. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and to the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows his time is short. When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. The woman was given two wings of a great eagle, so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the desert where she would be taken care of for a time, times, and half a time out of the serpent's reach. Then from his mouth the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with the torrent. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman, and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Amen. For several years during the 1970s, when I was a theological student, I got a job as a temporary postman in the town in which my father was the local Presbyterian minister. It did help that the manager of the post office was also a member of our congregation. Apart from having to get up at 4.30am on cold December mornings to start work, 
the biggest eye-opener was discovering all that went on out back at the local post office. You see, I just thought that the post appeared through our letterbox and had no idea what went on behind the scenes in terms of sorting, packing, working out addresses, reading almost illegible handwriting, there were no computers in those days, and organising before the post could be delivered. We've been celebrating Jesus' birth and, and most of us are pretty familiar with what happened up front that first Christmas. So what I want to do this morning is to invite you to look with me at Revelation 12 and to go behind the scenes of Christmas. By using symbols and images, and some of them are very over the top and grotesque images, John, the writer of Revelation, lets us know what is happening out back as far as Christmas is concerned. He takes us behind the scenes of Christmas. And as he does so, John is announcing fantastic news for us. He's telling us to celebrate Satan's failure. Because everything that Satan does in this passage bombs big style. So let's go behind the scenes of Christmas and celebrate Satan's abject failure. Right away in verses 1 to 6 we're told about Satan's failure to stop Jesus coming into the world. Satan's failure to stop Jesus coming into the world. One of the last in-person meetings I attended before lockdown away back in the spring was a meeting of the, the church development group. Uh, a guest speaker came along to talk about some aspects of church development. So the first thing that David Meredith, the person hosting the meeting, did was to introduce the guest speaker to all of us. And John does something similar in these verses. He introduces us to the main players in the drama. And the first of the three main players John introduces us to is the woman. And he does so in verses 1 and 2. Now, like lots of stuff in Revelation, there are at least five and three quarters of different views on who she is. Without going into all the ins and outs of the matter, except to point out that the way she is described in verse 1 as being clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head, is a clear throwback to Genesis chapter 37 verse 9. And that means that the woman is not specifically Mary, Jesus' mother. But it's telling us that she represents, in general terms, God's people, the church, the community from which God's Messiah would come. The second main player is the dragon. We find him in verse 3. He has power as symbolised by his ten horns and he's not slow in using his power which is what all this stuff about him knocking one third of the stars out of the sky and dumping them on the earth is all about. He also makes claims to have authority which is what the ten crowns on his head represent. And we don't have to argue about who the dragon is because in verse 9 we're told who he is. He's identified as Satan. The third main player is the male child in verse 5. And once more we don't have to guess as to his identity. In verse 5 we're told that he is the one God has designated to rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And that's a straight lift from Psalm 2 verse 9. A psalm about God's Messiah who will exercise sovereign rule over the nations. And throughout the New Testament, that psalm is always applied to Jesus. So, having introduced us to the main players in this drama, the woman, the dragon, the male child, or the church, Satan and Jesus, God, John goes on to outline the plot. And it's quite simple. 
Satan wants to put an end to God's plan of salvation through Jesus the Messiah. And here are the symbols and images John uses, and some of them are pretty horrible. And we discover that the dragon positions himself in front of the woman who is in labour, and he's poised to gobble up her baby the moment he's born. It looks as if God's plan of salvation, which is tied up in this male child, is, going to get, is not going to get off the ground. For a woman in childbirth is no match for an enormous red dragon. But when everything looks bleak, a rapid rescue takes place. And the newborn male child, end of verse 5, is snatched up to God and his throne. And the woman herself escapes to the desert where God takes care of her. Verse 6. Satan has totally failed to stop Jesus coming to save because the male child is safe from the dragon. God's plan of salvation has been carried out because the male child has been snatched up to God and his throne. Some get a little twitchy here that there's no mention of Jesus' death and resurrection in the imagery because it goes straight from his birth to his ascension. But people like that need to calm down and take another sip of chamomile tea. It's symbolism and imagery. It's not precise science. Jesus' birth and ascension are the last, or the first and the last events of his life on earth. They're, they're like a brackets in a mathematical equation. They include everything else. And these two references include everything else that Jesus did between these bracket events, such as dying on the cross and rising from the dead. So Satan's diabolical plan has gone up in smoke and God's plan of salvation has been most triumphant. Now, given the emphasis on Jesus' birth, the most obvious way in which the, the symbolism of Revelation 12 verses 1 to 6 played itself out in history is in the events recorded in Matthew chapter 2 verses 13 to 16, an, innocent, uh, 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 an incident known as the slaughter of the innocents. You remember what happened when the wise men arrived in Jerusalem where they they, they asked where they could find the newborn king of the Jews. Uh, and Herod was troubled. And so were the citizens of Jerusalem. Because they knew from bitter experience that when Herod was troubled, there was going to be trouble. Herod was the, the paranoid ruler of Judea who dealt ruthlessly with anyone he thought might be wanting to take over his throne. And, and as he grew older, he became increasingly paranoid uh, and more brutal. Uh, and this incident takes place towards the end of his reign. So we know that, that Herod worked out from the wise men uh, and what they told him, uh, that the star which signalled the royal birth had appeared about two years before they arrived in Jerusalem. And so he knew that this latest perceived threat to his throne was a toddler about two years old uh, and under the pretext of wanting to worship him he, he told the wise men to find out where the newborn king was so that he could pay him a visit however god god warned the wise men uh, by means of a dream not to go back to herod so they returned home by an alternate alternative route when Herod realised that the wise men had done a runner and left him on the lurch, he was livid. So he sent his thugs to Bethlehem and the surrounding area, telling them to wipe out any boys two years and under. Sounds very much like Revelation 12 verse 4 and the dragon waiting to devour the male child. And when the bloodbath was over, there were tears in Bethlehem. Funerals were taking place all over the town. Parents are distraught as they stand beside the graves of their toddlers. And yet, for all the slaughter and carnage, the anguish and the grief, the male child was snatched up. And the angel told Joseph to escape to Egypt because Herod wanted to destroy Jesus. So in the dead of night, um, before Herod's troops reached Bethlehem, Joseph 
did what he was told and left for Egypt, Egypt with Mary and Jesus. The male child had been snatched up. And the irony of the location to which they headed shouldn't be lost on us. Jesus would be safe in Egypt. Egypt, which had once been the place of oppression and slavery, which had once been the place where Pharaoh had ordered the slaughter of all Hebrew boys, would now become the place of safety and refuge. And all this is underlying how much Satan had failed. His scheme to stop Jesus coming into the world to save had bombed spectacularly. God's plan to save people through Jesus the Messiah was still on track. Nothing Satan could do could stop Jesus from achieving his people's salvation. So that's the first thing we want to know, notice as we go behind the scenes out back at Christmas. On the 16th of December 1944, German forces launched an offensive in the Ardennes region of Belgium and Luxembourg, which became known as the Battle of the Bulge. Hitler's plan was to split the Allied forces in two and capture the strategic port of Antwerp, through which the Allies were bringing a great deal of their supplies, and so bring their advance on Germany to a grinding halt. Against the advice of his top military advisers, Hitler committed a massive amount of troops and equipment to this offensive. The Battle of the Bulge was a bloody affair, with the US 12th Army suffering 19,000 casualties, which in terms of losses was the heaviest suffered by the Americans during World War II. The German attack might have been furious, but it was Hitler's last throw of the dice. It was launched from a position of weakness, not strength. In Revelation 12 verses 7 to 17, we come across Satan's battle of the bulge. Even though he is a big time loser, Satan's failure to stop Jesus coming to save doesn't mean that he just rolls over and gives up. On the contrary, his failure makes him angrier than he was before. End of verse 12, Satan has been defeated. His time is short, but he is still mad, filled with fury. He vents his rage on us. Which is why the loud voice in heaven said, Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. In his anger, Satan accuses Christians, verses 10 and 11, tries to wipe out the church, 13 to 16, and attempts to sidetrack individual Christians, verse 17. Yet even as he does this, he fails miserably. Because all the devil's fury is not a sign of his strength, but it's a sign of his weakness. So let's tease this out in a little bit more detail. And I want you to notice in verses 10 and 11 that we're told about Satan's failure to successfully accuse Christians. Satan's failure to successfully accuse Christians. Some of the symbols used by, for Satan in this chapter are, are scary and frightening, like an enormous a red dragon and an ancient serpent. But others are more sinister and menacing, like the one at the end of verse 10, where Satan is referred to as the accuser. And we get an idea of how Satan operates as the accuser from the opening chapters of Job, and especially Job chapter 1 verses 16 to 12 and chapter 2 verses 1 to 6. God asks Satan if he's not impressed by the way God, by the way Job serves God wholeheartedly. And Satan spits. Of course he serves you wholeheartedly, he snaps back. Do you think Job does all this out of the sheer goodness of his heart? Why? No one ever had it so good. 
You pamper him, making sure nothing bad ever happens to him. It's a no-brainer for Job. He can't lose. You see, what Satan's accusation is, Job only serves God wholeheartedly because he knows which side uh, of the bre his bread is, is the, is side his bread is buttered on. Satan tries to put Job down by questioning Job's motives. His accusation is full of innuendos and insinuations. Our problem is that when Satan wants to accuse us, he doesn't have to resort to innuendos and insinuations because our sin is glaringly obvious. Our self-centered actions, sharp words, selfish attitudes and dodgy motives mean that when it comes to putting us down, Satan doesn't need to make stuff up. He just says it as it is. His highlighting of our failure devastates our Christian lives. It stymies our Christian service. It stymies and cripples our enjoyment of Jesus and his love. And it, it shreds us of our sense of assurance and robs us of our hope. How do we cope with the fury of these accusations? Well, the answer is in verse 11. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Jesus' death is the comeback, the pushback to all Satan's accusations. Every accusation that Satan throws at us has been dealt with at the cross. Jesus' blood has covered all our failure, our rebellion, our self-centeredness. So when he accuses us and says, how could you be a Christian if you do all that stuff and think that way and, and talk like that? We say to him, Satan, everything you say is true. And you haven't even raised a fraction of my sins. But you've forgotten something. Jesus' death on the cross. His shed blood trumps all your accusations. When we face the fury of Satan's accusations, we must not say to him, well, you know, you're just uh, sort of topping it up too much and you're a bit over the top. We mustn't say that. We mustn't look at ourselves. We must go to the cross and run to the cross as fast as we can and there pray in John Newton's words, Lord, be my shield and hiding place that sheltered near your side, I may my fierce accuser face and tell him you have died. I want you to notice in the third place, in verses 13 to 16, Satan's failure to wipe out the church. Satan's failure to wipe out the church. The spotlight once again zooms in on the woman who you recall stands for God's people, the church. We left her in the desert being cared for by God in verse 6 and now her story is picked up again in verses 13 to 16 and in these verses we find uh, Satan is after her trying to eliminate her and as we watch the dragon venting his anger on the woman we once again fear for her future. She may no longer be in labour but it's still a bit of a mismatch. The outlook does not look very bright for the church as Satan launches his onslaught. But help is at hand. God is protecting her. God is watching over his people. For starters, God protects her by caring for the church. Look at verse 14. The woman was given two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the desert where she would be taken care of for a time, times and half a time out of the serpent's reach. Uh, the passive form of the verb at the start of verse 14, the woman was given, indicates God's activity. And what did God give her? He gave her two wings of a great eagle. And that phrase takes us back to Exodus 19 verse 4, where God speaks of his provision to his people in this way. You yourselves have seen what I did to you did to you did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles wings and brought you to myself 
You see, in spite of Satan's frantic attempt to wipe out the church, God is caring all the time for his people. And God also protects her by helping the church. Verses 15 and 16. Then from his mouth the, Satan, the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with a torrent. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Satan is trying to overwhelm the church. But his tactics did not work because the earth came to the woman's assistance. And what's all this earth gulping about? It's telling us that when push comes to shove, God's promise of Isaiah 43 verses 2 and 3 is still in play. When you pass through waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep you away. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Saviour. In spite of Satan's frantic attempt to overwhelm the church with rough times, she will not go down because God will help her. And the final failure on Satan's part is celebrated in verse 17 and it's Satan's failure to sidetrack individual Christians. Satan's failure to sidetrack individual Christians. Having failed to take out the woman, Satan heads off to make war against her offspring. Now who's John talking about? The woman's offspring, according to verse 5, is Jesus, the male child, the Messiah. This means that the rest of her offspring are individual Christians who trust in Jesus and as a consequence obey God's commands and testimony, hold to the testimony of Jesus. What are we to do as individual Christians when Satan has a go at us? We're simply to do what we are doing now, obeying God's commands and holding to the testimony of Jesus. And what does that mean? Well, obeying God's commands is fairly straightforward. We do what the Bible teaches and let its standards shape our thinking and behaviour. What about holding to the testimony of Jesus? It could be either mean the testimony about Jesus he gives us in his word or the testimony about Jesus which we profess before others. Or it could mean both. After all, this is John's style to toss in phrases and words that have double meanings. Whether it is by accusing us or by launching an all guns blazing frontal assault on us or by trying to sneakily creep up behind us and stab us in the back. The danger we all face when Satan attacks us is of becoming so absorbed with our problems that we are sidetracked from what we're supposed to be doing. However and whenever Satan is getting at us, we must always remember that God wants us to obey his commands, to hold firm to the truth about Jesus and to unashamedly bear witness to Jesus. Today we've gone behind the scenes of Christmas. We've seen how all Satan's plans to stop Jesus coming to save, to accuse us, to wipe out the church, to strive, to sidetrack us have failed miserably. Well, we've been, in a sense, celebrating Satan's abject failure. But more than that, we have been celebrating something even more spectacular, the glorious success of God's purposes. We are God's people. He promises to be with us, to bless us. He protects us and one day he will bring us totally safely to heaven where we'll be free from all Satan's assaults and that is our great hope and in the meantime as we wait patiently for the perfection of that hope we shelter under the blood of the Lamb. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, the conquering lamb, we celebrate your victory over Satan. We bless you that you have come to save us, that you did save us, and we've experienced the blessings of your salvation. We bless you too for the way that you protect us from Satan's rage. 
Help us to shelter under your shed blood when he accuses us, when he tries to wipe us out. Help us to experience your care. When he attempts to sidetrack us, help us to do our duty. Lord Jesus, the one designated to rule all the nations with an iron scepter, we join in with the praise of heaven and say, now has come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. Lord Jesus, our Emmanuel, be with us as we wait for the perfection of these promises that you give to us. Accept our worship and hear our prayer because we pray in your name and for your sake. Amen. We're going to finish off our service by singing part of Psalm 94. We're going to sing verses uh, 14 to 19. It's a, a psalm that tells us that God will not abandon uh, his people. He will, he will look after us and protect us. And that brings us great comfort. Uh, the Lord will not abandon the folk who are his own, his heritage, his chosen. He never will disown. We're going to sing it to the tune at Bremen. And we again thank Glasgow City Free Church for the use of their music. Spirit, all who are loved by the Father, and all who are kept by Jesus the Son, increasingly experience God's mercy, peace, and love. Amen. Thank you very much for watching and listening. May God bless you, and may you know His presence and His help and His grace as you step into the new year of 2021.